Hello, and welcome to the DC Bar Pro Bonos webinar on understanding your organization's contracts during and after the COVID-19 pandemic, brought to you in partnership with Ballard Spar, District Bridges, and the Coalition for Neighborhood Housing and Economic Development. I'm Christine Kulumani, staff attorney with the DC Bar Pro Bono Center's nonprofit and small business legal assistance programs. Thank you to my colleagues that helped make today's webinar possible and put in all of the work. Also, tremendous thank you to Ballard Spar. Desmond Connell and Eben Hansel are both partners in the firm's real estate practice group and jumped at the opportunity to present this webinar for you all today. We're incredibly grateful for their expertise. Also, thank you to District Bridges and the Coalition for Neighborhood Housing and Economic Development for partnering us on this webinar and working to provide additional programming to small businesses throughout the month of May on top of their everyday support for small business owners. Before we get started, I'd like to go over some of the logistics for today's webinar. First, this webinar will be recorded. You can rewatch it later and you, because it will be so helpful, you can also send it to your friends and colleagues. Additionally, you have access to a version of the slides in your GoToWebinar control panel on the right side of your screen. Also on the right side of your screen, there is a questions box. You may type your questions into that box throughout the webinar. Again, thank you all for joining us today. COVID-19 has thrown the world into a state of disarray and uncertainty for what the future holds. For lots of organizations, the present and the future were already planned and put into writing, into contracts. Many of these contracts have been impacted by COVID-19, from canceled events to inability to uphold financial obligations. So today, Desmond and Evan will talk with us about some of these contracts that have been disrupted and how you may be able to better understand your rights and obligations. Thank you both again, Des and Evan. Thank you very much, Christine. And thank you everyone for tuning into our program. We know you all are very busy, especially during this very stressful time, and we appreciate the fact you've set aside some time for us. Eva and I will do our best to make good use of your time and share as much information as we can with you. We hope you all are staying safe and healthy. As Christine said, the title to the program is Understanding Your Organization's Contracts during and after the COVID-19 pandemic. And so Evan and I will be discussing mostly legal concepts today. But before getting into the legal theories, I'd like to offer some practical advice. If you are having difficulty as a contract party, whether it's a lease, a service contract, whatever it might be, regardless of whether you technically have a legal basis, you should reach out to the counterparty to see if some agreements can be reached. Companies large and small are seeking relief today. I see it a lot in leases because I spend a lot of my time working on leases, but it applies to other contracts as well. I had a conference call recently with some brokers at one of the larger real estate companies. And the comment was made that, frankly, what's in the lease doesn't matter that much. This is all gonna take place outside the four corners of the lease based on business considerations rather than the pure legal theories. And it isn't to say the legal theories aren't important or that you shouldn't try to understand them, which is what Evan and I are here to do today. But I don't want to give you the impression that if you walk away from this webinar, webinar thinking that you don't have any legal basis, that you have no recourse. Reach out to your landlord or your, the counterparty and see if that person is willing to engage in some sort of modification to your agreement. We are in absolutely uncharted waters here and everyone is suffering. 
Okay. Well, having said that, let me give you an overview of how we're going to approach our talk this afternoon. The first topic is going to be covered, well, the first three or four topics will be covered by Evan. We're going to talk about force majeure. This is a boilerplate concept that many folks didn't give much thought to until the pandemic hit, and now it is an absolute cause celeb in the real estate legal world. Everyone is talking about force majeure and what it means, and I can assure you there are very few people better qualified to talk to you about it than Evan. Evan's also going to talk about some common law defenses other than force majeure, and he's going to also deal with some of the impacts of these specific defenses and theories with respect to specific types of contracts. I'll then discuss some DC legislation. The DC Council has been very active and some very pro-tenant type legislation. I wanna bring you up to date on that. And then we're gonna dive briefly into some concepts pertaining to insurance, particularly business interruption insurance and liability insurance. And then we'll sort of review some actions you should take under your existing contracts and then we'll talk about negotiating contracts post COVID-19. Now, this is the first and only time Evan and I are gonna give this webinar, so we don't know how long all of this is going to take. However, we're hoping it will take about 50, 45, 50 minutes, which will leave a few minutes to answer your questions. So with that, Evan, take it away. All right, thank you, Des. Uh, welcome, everyone. Good afternoon, and thank you for joining us. Um, as Des said, I'm going to focus primarily on force majeure, and I'm also going to be looking at some common law defenses that may apply in the absence of a force majeure clause, and how the pandemic and force majeure may play out under specific types of contracts. Um, so my goal here is to convey some practical tips. Uh, this is not intended to be a law school lecture, so I'm not going to be digging into case law. I'm not going to try to tell you how this would play out in every different jurisdiction. Um, and I'm going to try to tie each point that I talk about to the current uh, pandemic as much as possible so that hopefully you can come away from this with some uh, practical tips on how to approach your contracts. So let's move on to the next slide here. Let's see. All right, uh, so up on the screen, uh, there is my attempt to define what force majeure is um, in as few words as possible. So I'll, I'll read this out. Uh, force majeure is a common contract clause that allocates the risk that specified events that are unforeseeable and beyond the control of the parties may cause a party to be unable to perform its obligations under the contract and may excuse or suspend performance. Um, so I've highlighted a few key points there, uh, and I'm going to walk through each of those and discuss them in more depth. Um, the big question that we've been getting from a lot of folks is, is COVID-19 a force majeure event under my contract? Under my contract, And the answer is, it depends. Uh, and the reason for that is that uh, force majeure is, first and foremost, a contract clause. So it is based in the language of the contract. It, is, it does not exist under common law as a legal principle that is separate from the contract. So if it is in your contract, then the scope of it is defined by the words of your contract. And if it is not in your contract, then you do not have a force majeure clause and you cannot rely on force majeure. Um, there are some other common law concepts that you can rely on perhaps, which we'll, I'll talk about later. Um, so the outcomes tend to depend heavily on how the contract is worded. And furthermore, they depend heavily on uh, state law. Uh, these are contracts tend to be interpreted under state law. So uh, there are many different jurisdictions. Each of them has their own court system and each of them is reaching slightly different outcomes on a lot of these questions. So there generally are no universal answers. Um, I'm gonna talk as generally as I can today uh, about general legal principles, but the reality is that it's very difficult to predict a lot of these things because it is so dependent on the contract language and on the principles of contract interpretation. 
to advance to the slide. All right. Um, so, as I said, uh, force majeure is a contract clause rather than a freestanding legal principle. So, the first tip that I would give is to look at your contract, pull it out of the drawer, and try to identify the force majeure clause in there, uh, see if there is one. Uh, most contracts do have some form of force majeure clause, but not all. It's certainly not universal. Um, you may find that it is labeled differently uh, and that the words force majeure are not used. Um, there is no magic to those words. It can show up under a lot of different names. Um, sometimes you'll see it labeled as un an unavoidable delay clause or acts of God or something like that. Um, any of those concepts can be uh, invoked in the same way as force majeure. But as I said, it's a contract clause and it either is in the contract or it's not. And if it's not in the contract, then you do not have the benefit of the force majeure defense. Um, the next important point is that uh, force majeure is a set of specified events that are within the contract. So uh, if you look at different types of contracts, you'll see different ways that this is worded, but there are some patterns. Uh, a lot of times there are lists of terrible events, uh, things like adverse weather conditions, hurricanes, war, civil unrest, riot, uh, the list goes on and on. Um, and those things will be listed specifically and it will say that these are force majeure events. Um, so if you're looking at a list like that and you're trying to fit COVID-19 into the list, uh, look for words like pandemic, epidemic, disease outbreak, things like that that refer to um, pandemics. Also look for things like governmental restrictions. Um, as we have gotten further down the road with this, the governmental restrictions are are oftentimes more restrictive than the health considerations of the pandemic. So uh, either of those things are, are uh, key clauses that you could rely on. Um, these lists tend to be construed very narrowly. So uh, if you have a list of specific items that are force majeure events and they do not include things like pandemic, epidemic, disease outbreak, um, then you may not, then the pandemic may not be included as a force majeure event. Um, most of these clauses, though not all, will have some sort of catch-all clause. Uh, look for words like act of God, or sometimes they're just described as force majeure events, uh, events outside the control of the parties. Um, these tend to pull in things that are not specifically listed and they expand the scope of the clause. Um, so whether or not the pandemic is falls within these catch-all clauses is a question of contract interpretation that is impossible to answer definitively. But given how all-encompassing this event has been and the, how wide-ranging the impacts have been, uh, we think it would be very, very surprising if all but the most narrow force majeure clauses are interpreted are not interpreted to include the current pandemic. So we think it's very likely that uh, the pandemic will be considered force majeure under the vast majority of force majeure clauses in contracts. There may be some that are very, very narrowly drawn that manage to exclude it, um, but that would be the exception. Uh, moving on to the next slide. Um, so the next important point to keep in mind is that uh, force majeure clauses are intend to, intended to address events that are not reasonably foreseeable. Uh, the idea is that events that are foreseeable, we went one too far there, uh, events that are foreseeable are should be negotiated by the parties. Um, and if they have failed to negotiate them and they are foreseeable, then uh, the general allocation of risk that otherwise shows up in the contract um, extends to those events. So all, really only if something is unforeseeable should it fall under the force majeure clause. Um, at this point, we do not know for certain whether the COVID pandemic will be considered unforeseeable. Um, it's possible that you will see some arguments that we 
have seen previous pandemics like the SARS pandemic within recent years, and that because of those, um, some contract actors should have been able to foresee that there would be a pandemic. Um, my view is that that is pretty unlikely. I think no one could really foresee uh, this particular event or how wide ranging the effects would be. So I think it is very likely that COVID will be seen as an unforeseeable event that should be under the force majeure clause. Um, that being said, when you're thinking about new contracts, uh, so contracts that are that you're entering into after the pandemic has already begun, uh, I think we cannot be so certain that it is considered unforeseeable now. And you should be thinking of ways to specifically allocate the known and unknown risks of this pandemic um, using specific language and addressing the pandemic specifically, rather than just assuming that if you have a broad force majeure clause, it'll take care of you. Um, you should be trying to trying to come up with solutions to the, to the specific known and unknown risks. Um, the next important idea is that there must be a causal relationship between the event and the impossibility under the contract. So it is not sufficient just that a force majeure event has occurred. It must be, the force majeure event must be the thing that makes it impossible to perform under the contract. So if uh, just the fact that there is a pandemic out there, that there are governmental restrictions out there, uh, that there is a great deal of economic hardship out there, none of these things by themselves are enough to justify not performing under the contract unless there is a direct causal relationship between those things, between the event and the impossibility of performance. And I would add that usually general economic conditions by themselves are not sufficient. Um, there has to be uh, an actual either physical or legal impossibility in performance. It's not just enough that it is more costly or that the expected revenue is not there due to the pandemic. It has to be actually impossible, uh, which ties into the final point, which is that uh, force majeure must make the performance under the contract actually impossible. Um, and you will see some different standards for this. Uh, some jurisdictions refer to commercial impracticability or inadvisable. Uh, some refer to illegal. Um, so you'll see these in, under different contract language in different jurisdictions. Um, and it is not sufficient that there's just increased cost or increased difficulty of performance. Um, and monetary obligations are generally not considered impossible to perform under most circumstances. Uh, you'll see this under leases a lot, and I'll talk about that when we get into the specific contracts. But the general outcome is that force majeure clauses do not uh, relieve the obligation to pay money under most circumstances. And it's not sufficient that there is, uh, that the business can't operate, or it's not sufficient that there's not sufficient revenue coming into the business to pay the monetary obligations. Um, the business is considered to have taken on that risk when it enter entered into the contract. So there has to be actual impossibility of performance um, in order to be excused. So those are uh, the basic elements of force majeure. Um, I'm going to move on to the next slide, which uh, covers some common law defenses. So as I said, uh, force majeure is a contract clause that doesn't exist independently of the contract, um, but there are some uh, concepts out there, legal principles that may be raised even if they do not appear in the contract. Um, so these do not require anything in the contract to be raised. Uh, they would, because they are defenses, they would generally only be raised in the context of litigation. So if you have not performed under a contract and are in litigation over that contract, these are possible uh, defenses that you could raise in that litigation. Um, for the most part, these are considered more difficult to invoke than force majeure. So it, 
it is not a good position to be in to be relying on these. These are sort of last resort uh, concepts, but they may be available. Um, so the first one is impossibility of performance, and this is very similar to force majeure. Uh, you'll see different wording in different jurisdictions, but the general concept is that uh, performance becomes impossible because a basic assumption of the contract that both parties held is no longer true due to an intervening event. Um, so the example that I like to give of this is uh, if there is, for example, a music festival scheduled mm -hmm. and there is a governmental order that says you can't have gatherings of more than 10 people, then performance of this music festival by the venue provider becomes impossible because the basic assumption of the contract was that people could gather for this festival that is no longer true. So in that case, uh, impossibility of performance may be a defense if there's litigation over the contract. Somewhere related to this is another common law defense uh, referred to as frustration of purpose. And this is very similar, um, but not quite the same. Uh, in, if you're claiming frustration of purpose, generally performance is not literally impossible. Uh, but some intervening event has undermined the fundamental purpose of the contract that was understood by the parties. So uh, an example of this, uh, sticking with the music festival example, would be if the organizer has contracted with a printer for promotional materials, and suddenly the, the event itself is canceled uh, due to governmental restrictions, then it's still possible to print these promotional posters, it's still possible to pay for them, but, so, but now there is no reason to do it. The fundamental purpose of the contract has been undermined by the fact that the event has been canceled. Um, so uh, these are things to keep in mind. Uh, they are much more rarely invoked than force majeure, um, but they are out there. So if you do end up involved in litigation over, uh, over contract performance. Um, these are concepts to have in your back pocket. Uh, I'm going to move on to how we have seen uh, force majeure play out under specific kinds of contracts. Um, first thing I want to touch on is leases. Uh, so force majeure clauses are very common in leases, um, but we have found that uh, most under most leases, force majeure clauses do not provide relief for monetary obligations, including rent. Um, this has been a very uh, hard pill to swallow uh, for a lot of tenants um, because they found that they uh, either do not have access to their space due to governmental restrictions, or they are unable to operate their business due to governmental restrictions or due to the pandemic, and may have thought that uh, force majeure would provide some relief, but um, as I said, monetary obligations are generally not considered to be impossible to perform, and force majeure will not reach to most monetary obligations, uh, even if it's impossible to access the premises, even if it's impossible to operate the business. Um, some leases come right out and say this. They'll say that uh, for the force majeure clause does not extend to the to monetary obligations. Some don't say that, but uh, it generally is considered to be the case whether it says it or not. Um, there are, you may find in some leases that there is some relief of, available, um, but if, you know, to the extent that there is, it would, be, it would be because it is specifically recited in the lease that under certain conditions there will be rent relief, but that would be the exception. Um, However, we have found that uh, you know this is a hard time for everyone, and landlords don't have a lot of good options and are willing to negotiate in a lot of cases. Uh, they may be willing to offer uh, rent relief or rent deferral or some other kind of negotiated outcome. Um, there are other possible claims that tenants have made. Uh, some have claimed constructive eviction, which is effectively if you are unable to access your space, then there, 
who can claim under the lease that that is effectively an eviction from the premises. Uh, the problem with this claim is that it, your remedy is not to not pay rent, it is to terminate the lease, which may not be the right outcome for every tenant. So that is not always the best solution. Uh, we've, saw, we've seen some tenants claim casualty, which is a bit of a stretch. Uh, we've seen some tenants claim landlord default uh, and, and maybe consider suing the landlord over uh, not granting access to the space. Uh, we have seen some tenants not claim anything at all and just say we, we are unable to pay rent and we will not be paying rent for the foreseeable future. And that's that. And in a lot of cases, the landlords simply can't do anything about it. Uh, Des is going to talk about the DC emergency legislation that has been passed in the last few weeks. Um, but I do want to note that in DC, uh, eviction filings have been suspended during the emergency declaration and for 60 days thereafter. And in some cases, there is a requirement, uh, depending on the type of tenant, that the landlord must offer a payment plan for rent deferrals. So uh, there's a period of deferred rent, and then there's a period uh, after the rent deferral period in which that would be paid off. So it wouldn't all show up as a lump sum. Um, so Des is gonna get into more detail on that. Uh, next topic I wanna to uh, touch on is loan agreements. Um, similarly to leases, uh, force majeure will generally not provide relief for monetary obligations on their loan agreements. But like landlords, um, lenders are often willing to negotiate. They may offer deferrals. They may offer forbearance, which is effectively suspending any enforcement of the loan agreement. So there may be a period in which they're willing to accept no payment and either uh, increase the payments over the rest of the term of the loan or extend the term of the loan so that they do end up getting all of their payments. Uh, they may be asking for concessions in exchange. So uh, there may be a higher interest rate. Um, there may be other substantive concessions where you're giving up some right under the loan agreement. But we found that, that lenders generally are willing to negotiate rather than uh, enforce their loans. Um, so like leases, uh, DC's emergency legislation has suspended foreclosures. Uh, so if there's a mortgage, the foreclosure process is suspended. And in some cases, it requires forbearance. So the lenders are required to grant a period of uh, suspended payments. Uh, I'm going to move on to the next slide. Okay. Uh, construction contracts are another topic that, where we have seen force majeure uh, be very important. You'll find that uh, in almost every case, a construction contract will have a force majeure clause, uh, and it is a, a very important clause under the contract, and it's one that is probably heavily negotiated and, uh, and includes a lot of detail. Um, they generally require notice if you are claiming force majeure because it's very important to establish the time periods for delay. So uh, often the, the deadlines will be suspended um, during periods of force majeure. Liquidated damages for late delivery may be suspended during periods of force majeure. Uh, I will note that DC currently is allowing most construction sites to continue. It's considered an essential business. Um, they are subject to some social distancing requirements, but for the most part, construction sites can stay open. Um, and there are, we've also found that uh, there are some common forms of construction contracts that folks tend to use over and over again without modification, uh, the most common being the uh, AIA forms, the American Institute of Architects. Uh, under those forms, our, our review of the force majeure con the force majeure clause is that the pandemic would be considered a force majeure event. Um, the, it would grant an extension of certain deadlines, uh, and it's usually subject to the architect's determination of how that all plays out. Um, so again, a good idea to pull out the contract and take a look at the force majeure clause. 
another question we've gotten frequently is how deposits and prepayments are handled. And unfortunately, there are no real universal rules on this. This is going to depend entirely on the wording of the contract and on contract interpretation. Um, so there is a whole range of possible outcomes on this. Uh, I think the the types of arguments that can be made are usually based on the purpose of the deposit. So whether it is considered a prepayment for a service that would be delivered in the future, and but the party making the payment has not actually received anything in exchange for their payment, uh, there is usually good grounds to ask for a refund of that. If it is an advance payment that is going to go towards certain expenses of preparing for an event or uh, prepaying vendors or something like that, where the money is likely to actually have been spent by the party that, that received it, then it's going to be harder to get back. Um, and I found in this case that the old adage of possession is nine tenths of the law is pretty true, holds true. Um, it is very difficult to disgorge uh, deposits and prepayments once someone has them in hand. Um, a lot of times the counterparty will uh, give you a credit and ask for a reschedule of an event or something like that rather than giving the money back. And usually this, the scale and scope of the monetary uh, amount in dispute is not big enough to justify litigation. So it tends to be a negotiated outcome with uh, a lot of frustrated parties, but there is usually very little um, guidance on this and you just have to look at the, at the wording of the contract. Uh, and the final type of contract I wanna to touch on are purchase and sale agreements. Uh, these could be a real estate purchase and sale agreement or a purchase and sale agreement for assets or for uh, the purchase of a business. Um, we found that uh, purchase and sale agreements do not always contain force majeure clauses. There are a lot of instances where they are just absent because the parties are instead relying on express termination rights or express conditions to closing. So there is typically a due diligence period where the parties have a, a free look at the property or the asset and have a termination right uh, at the end of that due diligence period. So the, if there is a force majeure clause, it's possible that it may extend things like the force majeure, like the due diligence period. Uh, it's possible that it may extend the closing, but for the most part, parties are, are relying on negotiated terms like termination rights and express conditions to closing. Um, for new agreements that are entered into post pandemic, I think it's gonna be important to, to make sure that those extension rights are expressly built in. So if it's difficult to access property to do your due diligence, if it's difficult to get permits or to record deeds or to get title insurance, uh, you should be thinking about those contingencies and building in uh, extension rights, building in conditions to closing that make it possible to address those and keep the contract in place. Uh, so that is the end of my presentation. Uh, I'm going to turn this back over to Des uh, to go over the remaining topics. So uh, thank you for tuning in. Thank you very much, Emma. That was very, very helpful. So I'm going to talk now for a couple minutes about the D.C. emergency legislation, as, as Evan has alluded to already. D.C. Council and the mayor have both been very active in doing what they can to alleviate the strain on tenants and other businesses. And the most recent uh, law ordinance was passed on May 5, the Coronavirus on the Bus Emergency Amendment Act of 2020. And it is a remarkable piece of legislation. Certainly in my experience, I've never seen a government require something like this before. You know, it mandates rent payment plan programs that landlords must, add, must make available to certain types of tenants. Now, it 
it's only retail tenants, commercial retail tenants. So often office tenants who I think are considered less impacted by what's going on than, than retail tenants cannot receive help under this under this ordinance. It extends to one year after the health emergency, and it does not apply to tenants who have received rent relief under DC's other emergency legislation. So it's vague in terms of what the landlord must provide, but it is clear that some sort of deferral of, of your rent must be made available by the landlord. And the landlord must reach out and inform you of the fact that these types of programs or this payment program may be available. A critical note here is you as a tenant must notify the landlord of hardship because COVID-19. So if you are in a position where you're operating a restaurant or some other retail establishment, this is something that you should attend to sooner rather than later. The, the statute, uh, I think, was signed by the mayor last week, I think May 13th, so it is law now, and this is something that should be of interest to many retail tenants. I am trying to move the slides. There we go. Okay, so I already covered some of this. Um, it does not specify payment terms. Prepayment is permitted. There can be no adverse reporting to a credit bureau as a result of this deferral. So this is, again, something that should be looked at carefully by any retail tenant in the city, I think, who needs help. And I think most do, given the fact that if you operate a retail establishment, you can't operate. It's hard to see how you could be doing well. So that's one set of programs or one set of help that DC has provided. Another, again, alluded briefly by Eben was the mortgage relief for landlords. And here our focus is on small businesses, so not so much lenders. But the, the takeaway here is that if the landlord receives relief from its lender under this program, then it must pass that relief on to its tenants. Again, there is a requirement that the tenants must demonstrate financial hardship due to the pandemic. But nevertheless, that's another potential avenue of rent help or rent deferral during these difficult times that the DC government is providing. The next item I wanna mention is a rent freeze. And there are no increases permitted during the health emergency to your rent. And again, this applies to commercial retail properties only. Office tenants are excluded. Finally, as again, I think Evan touched on this briefly, no evictions or filings. So this is one of the aspects of the, of the relief that's being provided that does cover all commercial tenants. So it's not just retail tenants who are getting the benefit of this. If you're an office user, if you have a, a business with office space, you may also get the benefit of this. And essentially what this says is there's no eviction proceedings can go forward. And under the new ordinance, the new law passed on May 5, it even prohibits filing eviction complaints. So that is that is helpful for, for tenants of all kinds. All right, now I'm going to move on to insurance considerations. And this particular subject Really, this insurance, of course, is a vast area. It's its, its own specialty, of course. But for purposes of this conversation and the pandemic, I think there are two sort of insurance questions that you should be asking. The first is under business interruption insurance. And the question is, do you have coverage because your business has been interrupted by the pandemic? Do you have coverage for your business, for your rent or other expenses 
that would be covered by a typical business interruption or income uh, policy? That's the first question uh, I think that you should be thinking about when it comes to insurance. The second item is liability coverage, commercial general liability policy, which I'm sure most of you do have a liability policy covering uh, your business. And the question here is, will you have coverage if you're sued for a COVID-19 related claim? And this is a important subject and something to drill down in. And we'll talk, I'll talk about it more in a minute, but of course, as you open up your business again, and people start coming to your premises or you start interacting with people, whether they're customers, employees, whatever, there's the potential, of course, of an infection which could lead to litigation. Okay, so let's, let's talk first about business interruption insurance. Now this is, I'll, I'll, I'll sort of speak broadly and then we'll drill down a little bit to some of the details. So everyone's been talking about business interruption insurance. It seems that, that the two main topics that we see a lot of material about and research being done and so forth when it, when it comes to this pandemic are force majeure, which Evan's already touched on. And everyone is also talking about business interruption insurance. And whether or not I have it, these slides have a mind of their own. Um, keep moving back and forth on me. So essentially, it's going to be an uphill battle to recover for your business losses under a business interruption policy based on the pandemic. But let's go over some of the, the theories or some of the, the aspects of this. The first is that it's typically included as part of your casualty policy. So it's your, your property insurance policy. And the scope of the coverage is actual loss of business income you sustain due to the necessary suspension of your operations during the period of restoration. That is a typical way to see this coverage uh, expressed and I should, I should highlight, by the way, that every policy is different and you've got to make sure you or your insurance agent checks the language of your particular policy, but that's a very typical way to see it expressed. And often it is tied to a direct physical loss of or damage to property of the premises. So a typical casualty is what they're frequently talking about, obviously, like a, a hurricane or an earthquake or something like that. And there has been a lot of conversation and work that's been done on the whole subject of whether a loss or damage caused by a pandemic really is a direct physical loss of damage to property. And I'm sure you can anticipate or guess the position that most insurance companies have taken on that which is of course, it, it is not covered. So that is sort of the general rules that pertaining to business interruption coverage. Now, be aware also that there are often exclusions uh, for virus or bacteria, which obviously would apply to a pandemic. So if your policy has that exclusion in it, that may be a problem right there, regardless of what otherwise would be considered covered and loss of market exclusions. And this is a typical one where, you know, the fact that your business is not doing well because the marketplace has not been kind to you, that's generally typical also as an exclusion. And also you see um, pollution exclusions as well for some, something caused by pollution. So uh, in general, between the way the coverage works and the exclusions, it, it puts the insured in a tough spot here in terms of trying to secure some relief from the insurance company uh, on business interruption. You also have frequently civil authority coverage where something has happened by virtue of the, an act of a governmental authority, which of course is what we have here. So that's promising 
However, frequently that's also still requires um, that it be covered, the, the loss be one that is covered. And again, the loss must generally be a physical loss. Okay, so takeaways on, on this part of it. It is an uphill battle, but you should review the policy with your insurance advisor because every policy is different and it depends on the language in your policy. And this is one where, you know, you don't want to try to do this, at, you know, on your own. You, you need the help of an expert uh, who deals with these kind of contracts all the time. Your insurance agent, of course, is, is the logical go-to there. And my advice would be, if in doubt, you know, file a claim. You know, that at least puts you in a position where you have uh, at least put yourself in a position where you might get some recovery. Now, several states have responded, and the District of Columbia has also tried, have responded with legislation that might change some of these rules on business interruption insurance. And there's essentially two types of legislation that's out there. There is, first, there is legislation that says, hey, we don't care what the contract says, insurance company is covered. Um, losses as a result of the pandemic are covered. Well, that's a tough one. And that there are all sorts of issues with you know, constitutional issues and so forth. And there's never there we have not seen any legislation of that kind passed. I I will point out, however, DC had included the initial bill that was passed on May 5 did include that concept um, in the bill, and it, it did not pass. The other less sort of direct hit on on this issue, but also would be extremely helpful, is we're seeing in some states, Pennsylvania is one of them, where it is requiring an interpretation of the policy that would say that COVID-19 is in fact a physical alteration that is insured. So that is promising, that is more likely to eventually be passed into law, but we're talking not immediately for sure, not likely to help, help anytime soon. And of course, we can expect legal challenges from an industry that you know, would be overwhelmed, frankly, in terms of the sheer dollars, if, if COVID-19 were considered uh, a source of business interruption uh, insurance for, for businesses. All right, let's quick, quickly move to general commercial liability. This is if if the business interruption is not likely to help you, I think the commercial general liability policy is likely to help you. And again, you should con confer with your business advisor. I mean, and your insurance advisor. This is going to be an issue because obviously, as you open up and as you bring people onto your business, you have the risk that someone will contract the disease and will blame you and will sue you. And so I would strongly advise that you look into this with your carrier and make sure you are in fact covered. There are normally, if, if you are, if I would consider this to be very similar to any type of sort of negligence kind of thing. And I think you're probably going to be uh, recovered, but again, look and see. Um, you, there may be some exclusions for communicable diseases, although rarely there may also be uh, mold and pollution exclusions. So again, this is something that I think is very important uh, for every business to look into and make sure they are protected. Okay, uh, I think I already covered the takeaways on this. Again, um, as I said, the slides seem to have a mind of their own. Okay, so recommended steps in general. Review your contract language, review your insurance coverage, 
says notices, even if not expressly required, take steps to mitigate your damages. So if you're being harmed by COVID-19, as most of us one way or another are, you don't want to sit on your hands. You want to make sure you take affirmative steps to try to at least reduce your damages. You want to keep detailed records of the impact and mitigation efforts. And as I said at the beginning, regardless of what are these complicated and sometimes confusing theories may or may not apply, negotiate with your counterparties uh, early and often uh, and see what whether or not they're willing to help you regardless of what the terms of your contract say. Keep also keep abreast of what's happening in terms of DC legislation because it is moving very fast. There may also be federal legislation at some point uh, that may might impact you. Of course, we're all familiar with PPP loans and things of that nature. So this is moving with very, very quickly and uh, it's important to sort of keep abreast. You should also anticipate disputes and declarations of default and consider um, impacts under other agreements such as loans and you should update your contract language. Now, as far as going forward, I think Evan did a great job covering this topic in general. And so we'll just sort of to review, as you go forward, I think it's going to be, as a lawyer, it's going to be essential. I mean, I'm, I, wouldn't want to, I wouldn't want to say malpractice, but it, it's going to be very important that any lawyer working in this area was negotiating a contract and the contract has a force majeure clause that the words epidemic and pandemic uh, or at least epidemic are, are included specifically in the list of covered force majeure events to remove any question of whether or not it is in fact force majeure and also um, to refer to government restrictions and so forth that result from you know, a pandemic or epidemic as we have seen. One of the problems we have here is a lot of what's happening isn't because of the counterparty, it's because of the government that's requiring the counterparty to act in a certain way, specifically, for example, with leases where the government is saying you can't go to the your office or your business you're required to stay home and the landlord's not really the party involved in preventing you from doing that and as evan already talked about this is of a generational once in a century perhaps event we're going through but it is one that i think makes any future sort of virus or contagion like this uh, unforeseeable it will be a harder pill later on to argue so that should be considered and you should therefore allocate your risks and responsibilities within your contracts so that you don't have to rely on a force majeure type interpretation for you so that i think brings us there we go again i apologize for these slides so <clears throat> We have about four or five minutes left. I don't know if there are any questions, Christine, but we do appreciate very much you tuning into our program. Evan and I uh, uh, hope you got something out of it. And if uh, you have a couple of questions, uh, we would be happy to try to answer them in the remaining time. Christine? Yeah, thank you, Des and Evan. We have had some questions rolling in and participants if you have some that you've been holding on to feel free to send them in and we will get to as many as we have time for one of the common questions that attendees are wondering about is what if they are a party to a contract that doesn't contemplate any modifications or negotiations are is negotiating with the other party still an option Evan, why don't you take that one? Sure. Uh, I would say that negotiating is always an option. Um, contracts sometimes will refer to specific types of modifications that can be made, but more often than not, they're silent on it, and the silence uh, should not be taken as precluding negotiation. Um, 
everything is up for negotiation. So I, I would not be shy, particularly now, about reaching out and uh, trying to negotiate better terms. Are there any tips that either of you have for renegotiating contracts? Um, you know, maybe renegotiations that are slightly more reasonable or strategies that may be effective? Um, I mean, it's all very context specific, but I think it's important to keep in mind uh, to try to put yourself in the counterparty's shoes and understand what their alternatives are. So if you are a tenant under a lease, um, you may look at the lease and say, if I don't pay my rent, I'm, you know, the landlord has the right to kick me out of this property and that would be the end of the world. Um, but from the landlord's perspective, having a tenant in the property is the point. So they are not interested in, in kicking out tenants um, and they don't have a lot of other options right now. So there is a lot of flexibility for tenants in some cases. Uh, it very much depends on the context. So uh, you've got to put yourself in the counterparty's shoes and understand what their alternatives are and why it is, it's often to their advantage to work with you to negotiate an amendment or a new contract rather than enforcing the literal terms of the contract and going to the you know often very draconian penalties and default provisions in the contract. Um, you know, when these contracts were drafted, they did not contemplate this situation. And relying on the language of the contracts that were drafted when no one had this in mind just doesn't make a lot of sense. It's much better to sit down and negotiate something that fits the situation rather than relying on this contract that doesn't fit the situation at all. And, and I would add real quickly on that, I think I agree with everything Evan said. One of the, we talked a lot about retail versus office. One area I think where office tenants may have a, a leg up, uh, one of the things people have learned that is that they can work effectively from home. And I think that's going to put a lot of strain on the office market from the standpoint of landlords. People are gonna need less space and they're gonna be less inclined, I think, to turn to, to office buildings uh, for their businesses. So uh, I do agree. I think there's there's a fair amount of leverage that, that tenants have in the office space that their landlords are in many cases are gonna wanna keep you. Okay. If organizations have entered into contracts that are not formal written contracts, for example, a series of emails that would form a contract or an oral contract, do any of the topics today apply to them? Um, I would say that uh, the force majeure, uh, because force majeure is a contract clause and has to be written into the contract, I would say that you cannot rely on the concept of force majeure. You may be able to rely on the common law defenses uh, if it did come down to litigation. Um, certainly, to my knowledge, uh, and Des, please correct me if there's anything different that you know, but if you have an, an informal lease uh, that isn't written down, maybe a month-to-month -month lease. Uh, my understanding is that the the rent relief provisions of the new legislation would apply equally to that. Um, so, you know, a, the vast majority of contracts, uh, in many cases, are not written down or maybe informal, um, but these contract law concepts may still apply to them. So, I would not uh, I would not automatically write off seeking relief just because you don't have a formal written contract. All right, we have one last question that we have time for, and this is possibly the most frequently asked. How can tenants find out if their landlord is receiving mortgage relief? You know, that's a good question. I can see why that would be a common one. I don't know off the top of my head, I'm guessing, well, of, of course you could you could ask the landlord, and I, I guess I would I would recommend that that you reach out to the landlord, and okay. and ask. Yes. 
Sounds good. Thank you again, Des and Eben. We appreciate you sharing your expertise with us and helping small business owners and organizations in the DC area. Thank you to all of our attendees. We will be sending out a survey, so please feel free to share your feedback there. Because this webinar is recorded, you can also share it with your friends. You'll be able to find a recording at our website, www.lawhelp.org slash DC slash CED. In addition, during the registration process for this webinar, many of you expressed interest in a one-on-one -on -one consultation with an attorney regarding a contract that you have. Along with the survey after this webinar, you will receive more information about signing up for a consultation. Thank you again to Des, Eben, Ballard Spar, District Bridges, and the Coalition for Neighborhood Housing and Economic Development for partnering us with this webinar today. Have a good afternoon. Thank you.